War veterans finding new friends and understanding. It's the living legacy of a fallen warrior. Next on Wyoming Chronicle. Hello, I'm Richard Ager. Welcome to Wyoming Chronicle. Every Memorial Day and Veterans Day, we face the same question. How best to honor our servicemen and women, both the fallen and those who have come back home? Traditionally, we express the sorrow of war with monuments, statues, bronze plaques with lists of names. Those are long-standing traditions. But there is another way to honor the dead while helping those who served and came back. On a ranch in Wyoming's Western Mountains, veterans and their families have gathered for a week of horseback riding, hiking, fishing, and being with each other. It is a secluded place, far from the electronic noise of TV, internet, and cell phones. This time for veterans, provided at no cost, is known as Warrior Week. It is part of the living legacy of a fallen warrior. His name is Chance Phelps. After 9-11, Chance was determined to be a Marine. He became one and served in Iraq. And it was there he was killed in action while defending his fellow Marines. Finally tonight, a town in Wyoming copes with the loss of one of its own. Chance Phelps' story was first told on the news hour. He showed great valor under intense weapons fire at him and his fellow Marines. It later became a powerful HBO film that portrayed his long journey home to Dubois, escorted by a Marine colonel. To honor her son, Gretchen Mack began the Chance Phelps Foundation to help other veterans. What brought this concept to mind and uh, how he went about doing it. Chances, some of his guys that were with him, they enjoyed coming out here. A lot of them came out to pay their respects, you know, obviously a year later or two years later. And so as a family, when they come out, we would just take them out sightseeing, you know, uh, whatever they wanted to do. We would just take them and show them the country that we lived in. And, and they loved it. And of course, Chance had told them stories and a lot of them he embellished. And um, some of the stories, <laughs> I can't repeat, but um, oh yeah, one of his buddies told me, he says, oh yeah, Chance told me that there was giant wolves and grizzly bears and they were gonna chase me from town to town and just on and on and on. I mean, just crazy stuff. And uh, so when we brought him out here and I, I looked at my husband one day and I said, you know what? Maybe we should try and get more of these guys, people we don't know, to come out and just see if they would enjoy coming out and going fly fishing or horseback riding, canoeing, whatever. We'll take them and do something. And um, Chance was a very avid outdoorsman, a very avid hunter, and he loved being outside, loved sports, loved football. And this was right up his alley. So... I thought, well, what better way to, to do it? The Chance Phelps Foundation provides a place for veterans to find new friends and comrades, to share experiences with fellow veterans, and escape the ongoing chaos of everyday life. Michael Ware is a former Marine from Cheyenne. He's spending the week with his sons Ethan and Ryan. When you came home the first time, what, what were the challenges, if there were challenges, that faced you to to come home, to reintegrate with society. I mean, being a combat veteran, there's obviously always challenges, you know, doing what you do. But I, I think the Marines prepared me to, you know, come home and accept the things that I did as a job. So it, uh, you know, when I first got home, I was young and I, I didn't believe I had too many challenges. But as I got older, I noticed that there was some challenges from being a veteran, you know. Mm -hmm. And what a, were they? Uh, you know, drinking was one thing, obviously. It, uh, I had struggles with drinking. Uh, thinking back about certain 
situations I was in during combat. And uh, Was that part of what was called self-medication, just trying to get away from the memories? You know, I believe so. It's, uh, you know, because like I said, as, when I was young, it, it didn't bother me as much. I still had that ego type of thing. And then when I had children, that kind of settled me down a little. And then you start to think. And, you know, there was times there were struggles with alcohol. And uh, that was probably the biggest thing. And just reliving those thoughts. And, you know, I had never really sought any type of help because as a Marine, they always teach you, you know, that's, that's not a good thing. You know, you're strong. You can, you can deal with it. And Do you think the Marines have changed at all uh, in terms of, you know, understanding that, you know, while you want to really foster that sense of, of independence and, and, you know, toughness within the Corps, at the same time, recognize that things can happen to soldiers and they can suffer certain injuries or brain injuries and have to, have to acknowledge that. Yeah, I, I've definitely seen more recognition on, you know, not having that tough mentality that there's been people that do come home as tough as they may be are going to have some issues. Has the Marines changed? I don't know. I haven't been there in a long time, but I think, I think the public has changed, you know, their view on, soldiers coming home you see a lot of more of these uh, uh veteran courts you know because a lot of veterans get in trouble you know for domestic violence for drinking for drugs and I, I think society's taking a look different look and going hey you know we sent these guys into a situation you know we asked them to turn it on turn that switch on for however long 365 days and then we put them back in a gentle environment and go turn the switch off now and sometimes that's hard you know, like even now, it's like even when I go walking out, you know, I teach my kids and you can ask them, it's like, check your flanks, look left, look right, you know. So I'm always in a, I wouldn't say heightened state, but I'm always in a state of awareness. So you'd probably say that there's some kind of reflexes that you're never going to lose. Absolutely. Once a Marine, always a Marine. And that's, you know, a lot of people don't understand it. That's what it is. You know, your laces go left over right and you always check your flanks. So when you make your bed, can you bounce a quarter on yeah, it? Yeah, I wouldn't is that... go that far. <laughs> no one's inspecting me anymore. So. <laughs> no sergeant uh, major <laughs> uh, overlooking that way. Uh, you know, what I'm wondering, too, I mean, here we are uh, on this beautiful hilltop um, at a warrior week. Um, how did you get here? What made you decide to uh, apply and, and attend? The reason that I came up here is I, it truly was for my boys, was to, to teach them, you know, that what the sacrifice is to to die for your country you know it's uh it's a tough thing you know it's hard for me to to even look at gretchen you know uh, marines are a brotherhood and uh her son made the ultimate sacrifice and i wanted my kids to know what that is ethan what's it like to to get away here with both your dad and your brother and just be surrounded by all of this. Well, it feels really good to get away from my phone, my my TV, my video games, because that stuff gets boring after playing it for nine hours straight. <laughs> and um, just the, it's different than being in, trapped inside a house and you just got your front yard and your backyard to like 150 acres of hiking and walking and horses and does it does it make you feel like um you know or just remind you of being a family a lot of the time it it sometimes just reminds me of my parents when we'd go out and have fun like that ryan what's what's your feeling about you know the, the three of you being together here this week and just, you know, the kind of experience that it gives you? It is, like, good to be in a really big mansion. A big mansion. Yeah, and Kind of like a lot of rooms, but they're all outdoors, right? <laughs> yeah. You talk about the BB gun and all? So... Is there anything else you guys would like to add to, you know, uh, our viewers who will be seeing this beautiful place and everybody kind of enjoying it? What, any other comments you'd like to make or let yeah, people know? Yeah, we, 
the mostly part to um come up here is um why we pretty much came up here is to honor chance and his mom and the sacrifices she made to um lose her son in combat and I just can't imagine if I grew up and my dad would lose me in combat I don't know what he would do because we do everything together. Tony Lewis joined the Army and became a Patriot missile operator. He was injured during the invasion of Iraq, but at first did not realize how badly he was hurt. There's a beep, and it's a warning beep from the launcher. Uh, it lets you know to, to get away. Uh, so uh, I didn't hear the beep, and he was like, I don't, know if, I don't know if we heard it or not. So we stood there at the entrance of the, the bunker, and before we knew it, two missiles went off, and the back blast knocked us down. So um, we didn't think anything of it. I mean, we were a little dizzy, but we were so excited. We first got launched, and we were high-fiving and stuff, and didn't think anything else of it. So uh, we went on with the rest of the mission, stayed there for the rest of the cup, uh, another six months, and uh, that was it. And little by little, after I came back home, uh, things started to change, and uh, stresses started to become bigger and bigger. Uh, started having the, like the paranoia and uncomfortable around people and things like that and each year that time went by things seemed to get worse and worse and then I started having the physical uh, uh, physical uh, symptoms of different things and some of it was mental had bad stomach you know ulcers and things like that because you're stressing out and then all of a sudden it was light started to bother me and my wife started telling me you don't remember our conversation and like no well, you don't remember my, my cousin so-and-so? And, no. Uh, so after a while, it started getting, and after so much of, uh, so many, uh, I guess, ailments come up, we, we started, well, we have to see what's going on. Are you satisfied with the care that you're getting now, that you've been diagnosed, that, that you're receiving? No. Are, are you satisfied with the care? No, the, the VA is horrible. Uh, especially mine in El Paso. They, uh, from other vets, from other cities and stuff, everyone says that El Paso has to be the one of the worst VAs. What's the big problem, do you think? Well, uh, I guess I'll tell you from the mental side, uh, I haven't had a psych doctor in 18 months. So with me, I had a doctor, we were going fine, and he left. So they scheduled me with another doctor. So I went to go see him, and when you start with the doctors, you do the questionnaire for your first two appointments are going to be a questionnaire do you do this do this check off everything and that's what they did so i get another appointment i go back that doctor's gone now so i have a new doctor you go to the new doctor what are you going to do the checklist so after a while i started telling doctors hey i've already done this four times you really need to do this again but because it's their protocol they're going to do the checklist so your care consists largely of filling out forms again yeah, there's no continuity at all. What, what do you want people to know? The main thing I want people to know is that you don't have to entirely rely on the VA because the VA, their operation is save the dollar. Their, uh, their operation is to cookie cutter medicine. Everybody comes in for the same thing. They give everybody the same pill. Everybody comes in for this and that is automatically arthritis. Arthritis is the first thing everybody gets. And then, like I was told, I had arthritis in my shoulder and come to find out it was a torn rotator cuff. But um, the VA is not the end all be all for vets. There's programs out there like, uh, like the Chance Phelps uh, Foundation and uh, Wounded Warrior and uh, Hero Miles and things like that that are out there to help. There, there's ways to get counseling uh, there's ways to get uh, away from the hustle and bustle of everyday life and not have to stress yourself out. Well, you know, speaking of which, I mean, here we are mm -hmm. on this mountaintop. What kind of difference does it make to you to have this kind of opportunity? Well, for me, it's, I enjoy it because there's no TV. There's no computer signals. There's no phone signal. So you don't hear the everyday ringing and the buzzing and the news on the TV and this and that to uh, 
Like sometimes I can't watch the news because they may show footage from the war and it just sparks something in me. Um, sometimes just being in the same area every day, every day, knowing that you're in this kind of cycle, I guess, and it's good to break that cycle. It's good to get away. It's good to breathe fresh air. It's good to relax. So um, it's been pretty therapeutic to get away and get out in nature. Okay. That, that does it for me, I think. Okay. And I want to thank you very much for sharing your story with us. Anytime. The Warrior Weekend is a time for veterans and their families. Just ask Kim Truesdale from Utah. Her husband, Alan, began his service in the Marines in Desert Storm in 1990. Well, Kim, uh, we're here in a really bucolic, beautiful setting, but, you know, much of the background that, that led you here is not quite so calm. Um, talk a little bit, if you would, about um, your experience with the challenges of a, a warrior returning home. <laughs> I told you I'm going to start crying. Um... The sacrifices that are made by families when they're gone are one thing. And then when they come home, it's really hard. It's an adjustment for everyone because they've been gone, but yet our world still works. I still get up mm -hmm. with my children. I still take them to the dentist. I still go to school. They dress, we eat our meals. And yet their world is so different. There's nothing normal. and when they come home, it's hard to find their role again as, you know, the father or the mother because things have been running smoothly without them. So you've got that struggle right away. And you have, um, obviously, you know, the, the physical wounds that are suffered, but you also have the, the emotional and the mental wounds that are, that are suffered. And um, I think that we talk about casualties of war a lot, but I don't think that they talk about the unsung, the, you know, the untold casualties of war, which, which are the children of, of the families that come home, especially with the divorce rate, um, the suicide rate, and just all of the, all of the extreme duress, uh, the self-medication, which, you know, everyone has done from time to time. So you feel this is kind of like the hidden part of the story, do you? That, Absolutely. I mean, we, we hear much. Uh, about, you know, veterans returning home and the various issues facing them, but not so much about families. Yeah, the, the children, you know, are the ones that really suffer, especially if, if the marriage, if, 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 if the marriage falls apart. And what are the pressures on the marriage? Well, um, there are lots of different ones. I have lots of friends who, I mean, there's the physical intimacy, um, there is uh, the self-medication and there is, um, I don't know, there's just, it's just, unless you've lived through it, it's, it's really mm -hmm. hard. It's really hard to describe it. What can you share with us about your, your journey? Okay. That well, when my husband first came home, uh, we've been together, we're, we've been married for eight and a half years now. And um, when he first came home from deployment, it, it, and that was in 2004, 2004. Right? Um, he's been in before that, but this was our first deployment mm -hmm. as a married couple. He, he wanted to be back. A lot of times they have survivor's guilt. They don't want to leave their brothers. They want to go back. And so it's really hard to be in this real world where everyone's happy and laughing and having a good time and spending all kinds of money and shopping and eating out and, and, and they know their buddies are eating MREs and they might not have eaten for, for five or six days. They haven't showered for months and, and it's really hard for them to do that. Did your husband feel that sort of guilt? Absolutely. That, that he and was back home safe? Yeah, I think so. I, I think so. I, I can't put words in his mouth, but we did. We had a lot of things and I, I, we had a fight. It's, it's, it's been a fight for our marriage and we, we've had to fight for our marriage. And I remember telling him before we got married, like, hey, I'm, I'm only getting married once. <laughs> and so you're stuck no matter what happens. <laughs> and there were quite a few times where, you know, it would have been so easy just to be like, you know what, we, we're done. Like, we can't do this. We can't live like this. We can't involve our children in this. Um, 
it, it, it would be so easy to quit, to give up, but I'm not a quitter. Did something turn it around for you? Well, for me personally, I'm, I'm very spiritual. Well, and for you and your family, I would say. Um, well, Alan quit drinking. He quit drinking, and that helps a lot. That that's probably was the biggest step for us. We had tried to, you know, he, he didn't really want to go to, to counseling and therapy, and we've tried a therapist. I think we've tried it once, and we never went back because it just wasn't something for him. I took my children to, to therapy and counseling with me and myself um, quite a few times. My, my stepdaughter is amazing, but her mother was actually a Marine as well, and she was um, blown out of an ambulance and was awarded the Purple Heart and had TBI and PTSD. And so my stepdaughter had both of these parents that, you know, it was just really hard. So it was for, important for me to, to make sure that she had an outlet. And so we would, we would go to therapy together and just talk about our things together. And here you are. And here I am at this amazing place. This is our first retreat. Um, what does a place like this offer? Well, it offers families to come and not have any pressure and to be able to reconnect and to just relax, just to relax. And as a mother, you know, for me, I don't have to, I don't have to cook. I don't have to clean. I don't have to do that kind of stuff. And I can just enjoy Sorry. <laughs> Your little one. <laughs> yeah. I can just enjoy to be out in, the, in this, this outdoors. And I'm telling you, this is heaven. Like the panoramic and, and just the nature and the gifts of this, this rancher to open up his ranch and say, hey, get here. It's all paid for. It's all. Let me, let me, let me thank you by this, you know. So, yeah. <laughs> you know, I, I know that... Um um, Alan um, declined our offer <laughs> yes, <my husband. laughs> to talk with him. Um, but oh, what would you say, and, this, and you're just actually early in the week so far, yes. but what would you say has been the, the kind of feeling that the, the family has had as you all are gathered here on this mountaintop? Just, um, well, I, you know, I hear a lot of my kids saying they're bored, and I'm thinking, how could you be <laughs> bored up here? But it is, it's peaceful and it's serene and there's, it's, it's far away from the hustle and bustle and the crowds and um, most, most vets coming home from war, they have a hard time with um, crowds, they have a hard time with loud noises and a lot of times they have a lot of ti hard time with smells. And that's something that you don't get in a Hollywood movie. You don't, and, and I can only imagine the stench of war. I can only imagine the smell of dead bodies and burning flesh and blood and gunpowder and um, I can only imagine the stench of war and I, it, it really affects people. A lot of times they can't go into crowds, they can't go to rodeos, they can't even go into a movie theater with the lights off because you know they don't they don't know what's happening and it's it's hard. You know, if there was um, some mistaken impression or, or myth that you would like to correct about when soldiers come home and reunite with their families, what would that be? That it's okay to ask for help. Like I think a lot of, a lot of this bravado, you know, and these guys are hardcore. They are, they are hardcore men who could literally kill you with their bare hands. And to say, hey, you know, I need to talk to someone is just not up their alley. And so I feel that, you know, in, in, in my world, what would have helped us is if, if counseling would have been mandatory. We'll leave the last word to Gretchen Mack and her advice on how to truly thank veterans for their service. Employers should really look at them and give them preference over anyone else because they're used to dealing with very volatile, high stress situations. And like I said, they're on time, they show up to work, and they're not gonna complain because guess what? They're not getting shot at if they're here. 
year. So, you know, they're making money and they're not getting shot at. So I think that's, that's the biggest complaint I hear from a lot of these kids. Nobody will hire me. So they need, they need something to do. They need a job. And they're willing to work. So, well, uh, Gretchen, thank you so much for making a difference. You're welcome. Doing my part. One little spoke in the wheel. A little spoke in the wheel. Well, that wheel has now taken hundreds of veterans and family members out of their daily lives and given them time to rediscover each other. They have found others who share their experience and discovered a wider circle of caring. If not before, then perhaps now they can feel thanked for their service. That's it for this edition of Wyoming Chronicle. Please join us next time. <laughs>